All right, we're ready to go. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Chris Clarkson today, and uh, we're going to be talking about uh, DFIT, FDA means flowback analysis, and, we're, and there's this new uh, technique that we're going to learn about today and, and talk about some of the evolutions uh, of this over some of the more traditional uh, DFIT methods. So just a little bit of housekeeping uh, to get started here. So uh, there's about 300 people registered for this discussion, so really, really popular one. Um, everyone's muted, and so if you speak, uh, we can't hear you, but um, there is a chat window, and you can ask any questions you want there, and that's where we're going to be uh, answering those questions at the end. And if for some reason we run out of time, we'll make sure that we follow up and send the answers to those questions as well. Um, chat window is just down here in Microsoft Teams. And this is going to be about an hour, and so we, sh we should be able to wrap up within an hour, uh, including questions and things like that. Uh, this is being recorded, so and everyone who's registered is going to get an email with a link in case you want to watch it again or share it with anyone else. So that is happening. Um, and this is facilitated by Whitson. So a little bit of background. Um, I've been with Whitson for about a year, and our main uh, focus is providing uh, web-based uh, RTA, PTA, uh, bottom well pressure solution to the industry. And there's about 80 operators who have partnered up with us in, in just the past three years. Um, uh, the biggest compliment we get is uh, the support. It feels like old Paquette, <laughs> which I used to work for. It's a Calgary-based company. Um, in terms of other training opportunities, if you visit witson.com slash training, there's a number of scheduled, uh, very specific courses that are available to register for, from PBT to bottom well pressure to nodal analysis. I'll be teaching that one. And um, there's some other number of other courses here about, you know, condensate reservoirs, why is this important? And then we even have some past webinars that you can access that are also under wisdom.com uh, slash training. And these are available to go check out if you see any topics that are of interest to you as well. Something to mention as well is all of our uh, Wisdom partners are able to join our annual uh, knowledge sharing session. This happens in Houston every year and we and this is really a full day conference that where operators are presenting case studies about RTA, PTA, DFIT, nodal analysis. So it's really just for our peers to present new findings or, or maybe struggles that they've encountered and they're looking for um, some insight from, from all of us. So just a heads up and you can email Matias. This is his email right here for that. Um, okay, so moving along. So Dr. Chris Clarkson, he's a professor uh, and the event of slash shell chairman or chair in unconventional gas and light oil research at the Department of Earth, Energy and Environment that used to be the Geoscience Department. Um, also an adjunct professor with the Department of uh, Chemical and Petroleum Engineering at the University of Calgary, UFC. I'm in Calgary, go UFC. And uh, his focus is on uh, the exploration for and development of mainly unconventional uh, gas and light oil. So most of his focus has been, as you probably know, on reservoir characterization methods for these unconventional reservoirs like you know rate transient analysis, pressure transient analysis, flow back analysis, deep fit, and uh, reservoir sampling analysis. So um, the big thing for me though is there's this thing called the Tight Oil Consortium. And if you haven't heard of it, you might have been living under a rock. But the Tight Oil Consortium is this amazing basically effort to push forward technology and learnings. Uh, it really, uh, like Chris, it's been, it's at least this, it's at least a decade old, right? The tight oil consortium, right? Yeah, we've been going since 2011. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I think it's really been like, I, like I, I called it a home. It's a place for um, our industry, especially operators to join and just feel safe to, to, to share to, and learn together because we can get a lot more done together than sitting in silos, right? Um, so today's talk is about, uh, DFIT, which means diagnostic fracture injection test, and FBA, which means flowback analysis. And in, in this talk, this is really developed by Dr. Clark's and Tight Oil Consortium Research Group. And um, we're just going to be talking about some of the advantages over traditional DFITs. And um, with that, I'm going to shut up and let you let you take it away from here, Dr. Clarkson. Well, thank you so much, Graham. I really appreciate the the kind introduction there. Just going to go ahead and uh, share my screen. OK, I'm assuming everybody can see that. Yes, looks great. All right, good. And I'm just going to get my laser pointer going here too. 
All right, well, thanks again, Graham, and uh, welcome everybody. Uh, happy Valentine's Day. I hope you love this talk. Sorry, I just had to do that, start off today. Um, so the topic is, uh, as Graham said, it's uh, Diagnostic Fracture Injection Test Flowback Analysis, uh, or uh, the acronym being DFIT FBA. And we'll talk about methodology and uh, some applications of DFIT FBA. Uh, just a little bit of background here. We've been working on this version of the DFIT now for uh, just over five years or so. And uh, our work on it started with a uh, former PhD student, Bainam Zangane, um, who uh, helped initiate the method with myself. And then uh, the work was carried on uh, by, um, uh, again, a former PhD student, uh, Daniel Zainabadi. Uh, who really helped us uh, advance this technique. And then now uh, currently we have a, a PhD student, uh, Sajad Hakparist, who is uh, helping uh, uh, continue to develop the methods. So lots of uh, work on this over the last few years. And what I'm going to feature today mostly is the work of uh, Daniel Zainabadi, um, just, uh, just because, uh, uh, again, he helped us with uh, many of the uh, advancements and applications that you're about to see. So uh, I'll start with an outline uh, in the um, introduction section. We'll first review the, the conventional DFIT, uh, the pump in uh, shut in DFIT that a lot of you are probably already aware of. And then uh, after we've done that, we'll talk about uh, flowback DFITs and our version of flowback DFIT, which is DFIT FBA, and we'll, we'll compare uh, it with the conventional DFIT and, and talk about some of the uh, potential advantages of it. Uh, and then we'll move on to uh, a theory and methods section where uh, we'll introduce an analytical model that helps us rationalize the pressure uh, versus time behavior of uh, not only the flowback DFIT, but also the conventional DFIT. Uh, we'll talk about a, a workflow that we've developed specifically for quantitative analysis of DFIT FBA. Uh, and then uh, we'll also uh, uh, introduce a, a straight line analysis uh, RTA type method that we've developed for estimating permeability from DFIT FBA. Uh, and then after we've gone through the theory, we'll show practical application of DFIT FBA with a, with a field example. And as, as you'll see with the field example, we're able to get uh, much the same information that we get from a conventional DFIT, but in a fraction of the time. And that's really the primary advantage of DFIT FBA. Uh, it's opened up a lot of opportunities to perform DFIT analysis in scenarios that weren't previously possible. So I'll spend some time talking about some of the uh, specific applications of DFIT FBA, and then I'll wrap it up at the end with some, some key takeaways. All right, so first of all, just a, a quick review of a conventional diagnostic fracture injection test. So we call this a, a pump-in shut-in test. Normally, these days in the unconventional world, we perform a defit at the toe of our, our lateral, and we start by pumping in our fluid, usually a water-based fluid, to uh, achieve breakdown. And then once we've achieved breakdown, uh, we uh, continue to propagate that mini fracture during the injection period. And then we shut down and we observe the pressure fall off for a period of time for various parameters of interest, including the instantaneous shut-in pressure, uh, eventually uh, the fracture closure pressure, which is our proxy for minimum in-situ stress. And then after closure, we may see inflow from the reservoir and observe uh, formation flow regimes such as linear flow and uh, possibly radial flow. So we can subdivide the conventional DFIT into a before closure analysis period and an after closure analysis period. And uh, we note that the before closure analysis uh, period could be analyzed for breakdown pressure, instantaneous shut in pressure, and closure pressure, which as I said, is our proxy for minimum in situ stress. So this is really the domain of stimulation engineers uh, whereby we're obtaining information that can be used in frac models so to help uh, fracture design for example uh, we can also use this uh, for evaluating uh, cap rock integrity uh, in after closure analysis we're primarily interested in 
uh, estimating the initial reservoir pore pressure and permeability. So this is really the domain of reservoir engineers. And uh, we note that we can use this information in uh, models for forecasting production or simulating injection, uh, but basically again in the realm of, of reservoir engineering. So um, here I've just uh, again just captured uh, a diagram showing the, the conventional pump in shut in defit. Um, eventually, uh, though, um, other types of defits were uh, performed and um, going back to the late 1970s, uh, Nolte had uh, developed the what we call the flowback defit or pump in flowback defit which uh, the first part of this is very similar to a conventional defit. We pump in, we achieve breakdown, we propagate our mini fracture. There may be a short shut-in period. And then after that, we start to flow back the well. Uh, so we uh, flow back the well at a certain rate, some, some fraction of the injection rate. And you'll notice uh, that uh, during uh, the flowback period, we see this kind of concave down flowing pressure uh, signature. Uh, and using uh, a method that we'll talk about a little bit more later on, the uh, tangent line method, we can obtain an estimate of minimum in situ stress. Now, uh, again, Nolte was a, a frac engineer, completions engineer, and, and he was primarily interested in accelerating our estimate of closure pressure and minimum in situ stress because they needed that information in frac design. But a problem with their testing is they flowed back at a relatively high rate. And what this meant was that when the when the fracture mechanically closed, it, it uh, rapidly closed and we lost connectivity between the well bore and the reservoir. So our ability to obtain uh, any reservoir information was lost. Uh, that was, uh, of course, intentional in, in the case of Nolte because they weren't really concerned about that, they wanted more of a rapid uh, closure pressure estimate. So subsequent to that, uh, in my group, we thought, well, uh, what if we flow back at a, a, a lower rate uh, that ensures that we retain that connectivity between the well bore and the reservoir? And so we started to look at that, we simulated that process, et cetera. And then once we uh, had convinced ourselves that we could maintain this connectivity, the next thing we thought of was, well, if we um, uh, look at the flowback rates and pressures, can we analyze that like we do a conventional rate transient analysis, uh, online production RTA, and uh, more recently we've had some experience supplying RTA to flowback data uh, after the main stimulation treatment. So the idea was to take the flowback rates and pressures and use analysis methods just like conventional RTA, i.e. using rate normalized pressure and its derivative versus material balance time as a log log diagnostic plot uh, that we could use to identify flow regimes, perhaps do straight line analysis and, and obtain critical information from the diagnostic plot itself. Uh, and therein was born our new method, which we call DFID FBA, where FBA now stands for flowback analysis, and we're analyzing that flowback data essentially using rate transient analysis techniques. So that's really, uh, in in my view, the kind of the primary innovation of what we're doing is is recognizing that we can analyze this flowback data quantitatively for reservoir information. So now that we've reviewed these three different types of tests, the conventional DFIT, Nolte's pump in flowback DFIT, and DFIT FBA, uh, of course, uh, the parameters that we're interested in are listed here on the left, our ISIP, minimum in situ stress, reservoir pressure, and reservoir permeability amongst others. And we note that with the conventional DFIT, properly defined DFIT, uh, where the shut-in period is long enough to achieve the after closure uh, flow regimes that we mentioned, we're able to get ISIP, minimum in situ stress, reservoir pressure, and permeability. But the issue is that depending on the permeability of the reservoir, it could potentially take days, weeks, or even months, if you're talking about nano Darcy type rock, to obtain those um, after closure flow regimes to get our reservoir information. Now, in contrast, if we look at the Nolte uh, flowback defit, 
designed specifically to get minimum in situ stress. Again, as I said, because uh, we lose connectivity with the reservoir by flowing back at a relatively high rate, uh, we lose the ability to get reservoir pressure and permeability. However, we can get a closure uh, pressure and a, and a minimum in situ stress estimate in a, in a matter of hours. So if you're wanting rapid uh, closure estimates, uh, closure pressure estimates, then that's a, a very good test to do. Uh, so if we look at DFIT FBA, which is an extension again of the flowback DFIT, we note that uh, we're able to get all the same information as the conventional DFIT, uh, but the advantage being that we can do this in a matter of hours and typical test times for the rock that we've been testing to date is on the order of about two to three hours. Uh, so as we'll see, this um, relatively small uh, test time opens up uh, opportunities to perform defits and scenarios that were never really previously possible, and we'll get into that a little bit later. All right, I'm going to start the, the theory section uh, by showing a conventional simulation. This was performed with the ResFrac uh, simulator, and what we're going to be looking at is the uh, flowing pressure trend and the fracture aperture trend during a flowback defit. Uh, so hopefully the animation works here. Uh, so basically uh, what we do is we first pump in, we achieve breakdown, we propagate our mini fracture uh, during which there's some, some leak off to the formation. Of course, this is very similar to what we see in a conventional defit. There may be a short shut-in period after which we then start our flowback. And so there's two things to look at here. Your fracture aperture is decreasing. Your flowing pressure is relatively linear and flat. During this period, as we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, the system stiffness is relatively constant, leading to this, le this linear uh, flowing pressure profile. Now at this point right here that we're showing, uh, we've uh, now started to see uh, a contact pressure uh, develop. That's where the uh, fracture walls first come into contact and uh, thereafter the system stiffness starts to increase significantly uh, and during the closure event and we start to see this non-linear flowing pressure profile. So this concave down profile is is indicative of the the closure event itself. Eventually we achieve our mechanical closure of our mini fracture. Uh, the pressure uh, drops below the uh, uh, the fra uh, sorry the pressure in the fracture drops below the reservoir pressure, and we start to see inflow from this uh, what we call fluid bank region that's developed around the fracture. So that's the zone where the the le fluid has leaked off into the reservoir, and we start to flow when we start to flow back. That fluid starts to uh, basically flow into our mini fracture. So we see this concave up. Uh, flowing pressure uh, profile, and then we see uh, essentially no significant change in that fracture aperture. So uh, again, we've done a lot of these types of simulations really to try to understand uh, what's going on at each stage of the process before, during, and after closure. Uh, and so the next step for us was to develop simple analytical models that helped us to rationalize and understand uh, this uh, pressure profile during the flowback defit. So again, the next step was to, to develop an analytical model. And for this purpose, uh, we, we assumed that the well bore and the fracture formed a, a, a single system. And with this assumption in place, we can write an equation that describes the pressure change over time for uh, the conventional defit as well as defit FBA. And we note that it's a function of the total system stiffness, which is the inverse of total compressibility, if you prefer to think of it in uh, those terms, uh, times the change in volume of our system, which again is this coupled fracture wellbore, uh, fracture wellbore system. So if we look at these components individually, we see that the change in volume of the system can be related to flow rates uh, into and out of our wellbore as well as flow rates uh, into and out of the, the fracture. So for a conventional defit, of course, we're pumping in and there's leak off occurring out of the fracture into the formation. 
Uh, and then with the flowback defit, of course, we're producing out of the well bore and we're seeing some inflow from the formation into the fracture. So very simple kind of rate balance uh, that dictates the, the volume change of the system over time. If we look at the total system uh, st uh, stiffness, uh, again, that's the inverse of the total compressibility. We see that it's a function of the well bore storage coefficient times the well bore volume plus the uh, compressibility of our fluid, which we're assuming is water-based fluid, times the volume of the fracture, plus the area of the fracture divided by the fracture stiffness. So if we take these two uh, equations and plug them into our original pressure change equation, we uh, uh, see that it results in, in this, uh, this particular equation at the bottom. Now, so with this in place, we can start to rationalize what's happening in terms of our flowing pressure over time for our flowback defit. So uh, here we're plotting flowing pressure, that's the, the black line uh, versus elapsed time during the flowback period. Uh, we're also showing uh, what the system stiffness is doing, that's the red line over time. And we're looking at this for the before closure, during closure, and after closure periods. So at early time, we see a relatively flat uh, linear flowing pressure profile, which indicates that our system stiffness is relatively constant. So we have an open fracture and that open fracture stiffness is relatively constant. Uh, once the fracture walls come into contact at this point here, we call this the contact point, we see that that system stiffness starts to increase during the closure period until we achieve the mechanical closure of the fracture. So during this uh, closure period, we see this nonlinear flowing pressure profile, kind of concave down profile, uh, indicative of the closure event. Uh, after mechanical closure, we see that the total system stiffness again remains relatively constant and approximately equal to the well bore stiffness. And uh, the pressure drops in the fracture below the reservoir pressure and we start to see inflow from the formation to the fracture resulting in this concave up, uh, essentially a reversal in that flowing pressure trend. So again, we can start to rationalize this behavior based on this analytical equation. Problem with this equation is there's a few things in here uh, that are difficult to constrain. So in order to make this equation useful for property determination development of an uh, basically a straight line analysis technique uh, we need to uh, simplify it and make some assumptions so for that purpose we used uh, conceptual simulation like i sh showed earlier to help us really understand the physics of what was going on before during and after closure and that allowed us to to simplify our analytical model based on some assumptions and the first one is that the fracture propagation starts at the or stops at the start of the flowback stage and thereafter the fracture surface area remains constant very important assumption uh, we assume that the fracture stiffness is constant before closure where we have a, an open fracture the uh, well bore volume change is relatively small compared with the fluid volume change uh, during the before closure period, in particular, the product of our uh, fluid compressibility times the fracture volume is negligible when compared to the wellbore storage term and the fracture stiffness term, which is the ratio of the area of the fracture to the, the actual fracture stiffness. Uh, we assume that the pressure gradient along the fracture is negligible. And then lastly, that the perforation and near wellbore friction are negligible, uh, negligible and that our flowing bottom hole pressure is representative of fracture pressure. This is a very important assumption because we require that fracture pressure in our analytical solution. Now, as we'll see a little bit later, this isn't uh, necessarily a good assumption, particularly when we're dealing with multi-fractured horizontal wells or horizontal wells in general, uh, where perforation near wellbore friction uh, may not be negligible, and we'll talk about how to relax that assumption uh, a little bit later. So using these uh, assumptions, uh, we're able to drive a material balance equation for before closure. And uh, what we're showing you here is that material balance equation. We note that the, uh, the uh, 
uh, V inject is the, the total injected volume. Uh, the next term over represents the, the wellbore storage volume. So this is our wellbore storage co uh, coefficient and wellbore volume. Piece of F is our uh, flowing pressure. Delta T is the, the flowback time. And PINT is the pressure at the start of injection. Uh, the next term over is our represents our fracture volume. S min, of course, is our minimum in situ stress. Uh, and then this term is very important. We'll talk about it in the development of our straight line analysis method a little bit later. Again, A is the area of the fracture. S uh, S naught F is our uh, or S O F I should say is our uh, open fracture stiffness. Uh, and then the next term over is our cumulative uh, flowback volume and uh, V sub L is our cumulative leak off volume. So again, driving a material balance equation that uh, really serves as the, the starting point for uh, straight line analysis. So the next thing to do here is put this in the form uh, that us rate transient analysis people understand. Uh, and so for that purpose, uh, we have derived a rate normalized pressure form of the material balance equation. So you recall early on I showed that conceptual rate normalized pressure and derivative plot on a log log plot. So we want to be able to take our material balance equation and plot it in this form for RTA. So for this purpose, rate normalized pressure is defined as our flowback, instantaneous flowback rate divided into this delta P term. And material balance time is, dry, uh, is uh, defined as the instantaneous flowback rate into the cumulative flowback volume. So just a, a variation on what we normally do for rate normalized uh, pressure analysis or RTA. Uh, and of course, we can take the derivative of rate normalized pressure with respect to material balance time to, to get our log log uh, derivative function. So uh, applying this definition of RNP and material balance time, we can then write our material balance equation in RNP form. And uh, you'll notice here that before closure, I mentioned that the total system stiffness is relatively constant, which means that the slope of this line is dictated by this ratio here on the right, which is the ratio of the cumulative leak off volume to the cumulative flow back volume. So depending on that ratio dictates the slope of this line. So for example, uh, just before closure, the cumulative leak off uh, decreases significantly. This term cancels and we see that the slope of this or, or sorry, the this relationship becomes a, re a linear relationship between RMP and material balance time and the slope of this line can be used to drive the total system stiffness. And we'll talk about the relevance of that a little bit later in our straight line analysis method. Uh, so the next step is to, to take this equation and uh, plot it in log log form so that we can start to see what happens with rate normalized pressure uh, versus material balance time. So this is our log log diagnostic here. I'm just showing RNP and not the derivative just for simplicity here. And we see that at early time, uh, this uh, slope of the RNP versus material balance time uh, plot is less than one, and that's because our leak off volume is not negligible. And that results in less than a unit slope on this plot. Eventually, once the leak off volume becomes relatively negligible and the flow back rate starts to dominate, this term becomes negligible and we form a unit slope on our diagnostic plot. So again, uh, that's uh, because the flowback rate is dominant over leak off rate. Um, this uh, flow regime we would refer to as uh, our fracture depletion period. At the end of this unit slope is our contact point. So up until this point, we have a system stiffness that's relatively constant. But after the contact point where uh, the fracture walls have come into contact, the fracture, uh, the so the uh, stiffness of the system becomes uh, uh, greater. Uh, we start to see an increase in that stiffness, and that results in a slope of this line that's greater than a unit slope. This is a non-diffusive event corresponding to fracture closure. So this greater than unit slope is uh, indicative of the fracture closure. Eventually, uh, after mechanical closure of the fracture and the, and the 
pressure in the fracture drops below the reservoir pressure. We see the development of a second unit slope, uh, slope line, and that's indicative of our fluid bank depletion. So we now have inflow of fluid from our fluid bank to our fracture, uh, forming a boundary dominated flow period in that fluid bank. And at the start of that unit slope, based on some simulation work that was done by Bainham Zangane, we were able to use this as an estimate of our initial pore pressure and initial reservoir pressure. So again, this, uh, this is courtesy of uh, Bainham's work uh, when he was doing his PhD. So again, we can use this um, RNP form of the material balance equation really to, to help us understand the characteristics of this log-log diagnostic plot. So with that in place, we can then start to develop a workflow for quantitative analysis of DFIT FBA, and that's exactly what we'll talk about over the next few slides. Uh, so uh, those of you that have read uh, my work on RTA and other characterization methods, you know that I'm very, very fond of workflows. Uh, so we've done the same thing with DFIT FBA, and, and really step one is uh, making sure you have all the the reservoir information required to do the analysis, uh, things like your plain strain Young's modulus, that's an input for our straight line technique we'll talk about a little bit later. You're also looking at making sure that the, the flowing pressure, flow back rates are synced and the quality is, is sufficient for doing a detailed analysis. So that's really you know, our QC step that we do with all uh, reservoir characterization methods before we press the button on a a piece of software. Uh, so that's step one. Uh, the first quantitative step uh, that we often have to undertake for uh, DFID FBA is this idea of, of um, uh, developing, developing estimates of near well bore and perforation coefficients. Uh, this is necessary to correct our uh, flowing pressure to an equivalent fracture pressure. So I mentioned uh, previously that was an assumption in our analytical model is that uh, this is negligible, but uh, the reality is when we're dealing with a horizontal well, there may be a uh, near well bore uh, region where we have uh, kind of fracture tortuosity, uh, kind of a pinch point if you want to look at it that way. Uh, and, the, and the consequence of that is that when we pump in during the injection period, the pressure at the well bore may be significantly elevated above our fracture pressure, or conversely, when we're flowing back, that flowing pressure may be significantly smaller than the uh, uh, fracture pressure. And so again, our goal is to make sure that the flowing pressure is representative of that fracture pressure. That's a basis of our analytical model. So we're gonna need to, to correct for this difference. Uh, one way to do this, um, courtesy of, of Daniel uh, Zainabadi's work, is to uh, uh, use this equation here. We're relating that uh, delta P due to friction, which is a combination, again, of perforation friction and near well bore tortuosity, uh, to uh, the essentially the sand face rate. You know, notice that there's two coefficients of interest, the perforation friction coefficient and the near well bore tortuosity coefficient. So in order to use this equation, we have to convert our surface rates to a, a downhole rate. Uh, and then what we do is during the shut-in period, usually there's a very short shut-in period just prior to flow back. And we can use the uh, uh, essentially the afterflow rates combined with that uh, pressure estimate uh, to uh, develop these uh, or to to extract these uh, coefficients from the analysis of that data. So once we have that, we can then correct our flowing pressures to the uh, uh, essentially the the fracture pressure and use our analytical method that uh, we'll talk about here in a minute. So again, this is necessary, particularly when we have um, multi-fractured horizontal wells where there could be that near well bore. Uh, tortuosity effect that needs to be corrected for. Uh, the next step, once we've corrected our flowing pressure, is to use our fracture closure diagnostic. This is very similar to what uh, Nolte had proposed. So again, we we have our flowing pressure versus flowback time. Sometimes we can use flowback volume as well. 
At early time, we see this linear flowing pressure trend again corresponding to that uh, case where we have a, a relatively constant uh, system stiffness, open fracture stiffness in particular. And then at this point uh, where the fracture walls start to come into contact, our stiffness uh, starts to increase rapidly and we see this nonlinear flowing pressure profile. And eventually we achieve a mechanical closure of our fracture and we see a reversal in this flowing pressure trend. So in order to estimate minimum in situ stress, we're, we're using the, uh, the approach of PLAN uh, from uh, 97, I believe was when that classic paper came out, which is to use the tangent line or intersection method. So we fit a straight line to that early time uh, before contact period, and then we fit a straight line to the late time uh, period around mechanical uh, closure, and the interception allows us to uh, obtain that minimum in situ stress. So again, this is the intersection method uh, that was proposed by PLAN to get our minimum in situ stress estimate. Once we obtain our, uh, our minimum in situ stress and our contact pressure, we can then move on and uh, look at the, uh, the uh, uh, flow regime identification plot. Again, log-log plot of RNP and, and the derivative is often uh, very diagnostic versus uh, material balance time. And uh, again, previously we, we talked about uh, why we see these different slopes on the plot. Uh, so for this particular step, we're interested in, in obtaining the contact pressure, which is the point immediately after uh, the termination of our first unit slope. That's our fracture depletion period. So we can define that as our contact point. Again, our stiffness increases and uh, we have a mechanical closure of our fracture after which we see uh, fluid uh, inflow from the fluid bank region to the, the fracture. Uh, the start of this unit slope is defined as our pore pressure. So we're able to get our contact pressure and reservoir pressure directly from our flow regime identification plot. Next step in the analysis is to do our straight line analysis. And uh, ultimately we want to use this to obtain permeability, but there's a couple of different steps that we have to take first. Uh, the first one is to, to realize that uh, during um, this before closure event, eventually that leak off volume becomes negligible. This term essentially disappears and we see a straight line uh, linear relationship between RNP and material balance time on our diagnostic plot that shows up as a unit slope. So we can actually use this unit slope data uh, combined with a straight line analysis technique to derive our fracture area and our open fracture stiffness. And those are two inputs that will require a little bit later to estimate permeability. So let's look at how we analyze this data a little bit more closely here. So as I said, during that fracture depletion period, there's a uh, linear relationship between RNP and material balance time. And from that linear relationship, we're able to obtain the total fracture stiffness from the slope of that plot. Once we have that total fracture stiffness uh, and we make an assumption about the fracture geometry, uh, whether that's a radial geometry or a PKN geometry, this total fracture stiffness or system stiffness, I should say, combined with an estimate of our plane strain Young's modulus allows us to obtain our fracture radius or in the uh, case of the PKN geometry, the, the fracture length, half length. Uh, once we have that radius, we can plug in to this equation to get the open fracture stiffness. Uh, and we can do this for both the radial and the PKN geometry. So again, using the straight line analysis method to obtain fracture area and open fracture stiffness. So that's a key step in our analysis that we ultimately use to obtain the parameter of great interest, which is reservoir permeability. So how do we obtain reservoir permeability? Uh, the first thing that we do again is we identify our contact point. And then once we identify the contact point, we use our material balance equation to calculate the cumulative leak off at the contact point. So remember the last step 
allowed us to obtain the area of the fracture, the total open stiffness. Uh, once we have these parameters, we're able to calculate the uh, cumulative volume at the, uh, uh, the contact point. Uh, we then use this cumulative volume at contact point combined with McClure's uh, H function technique to drive an estimate of permeability. So again, once we have this cumulative leak off volume at the contact point, we use this equation to derive the parameter of interest, which is permeability. So just for reference, I've provided the H function definition from McClure at the bottom of the slide here. So uh, again, at this point, we've now estimated the reservoir permeability using before closure data and specifically right at that contact uh, contact point. All right, enough theory. OK, you're probably going, gee whiz, this talk's going to be a slog if we have to listen to theory the whole time. So I'm going to show you some practical applications. And I'm going to start with a field example, and uh, this is a, a field example uh, in the Montney Formation here in, in Western Canada, and I apologize for the metric units here. Um, but basically, uh, the, the kind of the, the classic plot that we look at is our raw data plot that shows our flowing pressure, which is in black, the uh, injection rate, which is in red, and the flowback uh, rate, which is in blue. Uh, for this particular test, uh, we injected about 8.9 cubic meters. Uh, we had, uh, you can see here, uh, injection rate to achieve breakdown, propagation of our mini fracture, and very short, rapid fall off here, uh, which we'll talk about here in, a, in just a minute. Uh, the average flow back rate is about 20 liters per minute, and we flowed back for approximately three hours uh, during this test. Uh, so a couple of things to look uh, for here from a diagnostic point of view. We have very rapid um, drop in, in pressure on shut-in, which suggests that near wellbore friction was uh, negligible for this particular case. It was done in an open hole uh, scenario. Uh, and then uh, we look at the flowing pressure, and you can see that kind of classic concave down signature, uh, which indicates our, our closure event. So at this point, we're looking at the data going, OK, we might uh, might be able to do something with this particular data set. So uh, following the, the workflow that uh, we provided uh, earlier, uh, we plot um, the flowing pressure versus flowback time to obtain our minimum in situ stress estimate. Here we're using the intersection or tangent line method. We fit um, a tangent line to that uh, early uh, before contact pressure data. And then we fit a, a tangent to the late time data uh, around the mechanical uh, closure event. And the intersection uh, yields our minimum in situ stress, which in this case is about 40.7 MPA. Uh, so again, if we do have near well bore tortuosity effects, uh, we would have to correct the flowing pressure uh, using the method that we talked about earlier. The next step is to use our flow regime identification to obtain our estimate of reservoir pressure and contact pressure. So again, we plot rate normalized pressure and its derivative versus material balance time on a log log plot. At early time, we see uh, the date on the derivative, which is the, the dark blue here. We see that that data falls below a unit slope. This corresponds to the period where leak off is not negligible. Uh, and that dictates the, the slope of that, that particular line. Eventually, once leak off does become negligible, flowback rate becomes dominant. Uh, we see a unit slope form on our derivative. Uh, and, uh, and as we'll see here in a minute, that's uh, the basis of the data that we use for our straight line technique. Uh, at the end of that unit slope line is our pick for contact pressure, which in this case is about 41 and a half MP, uh, megapascals. Uh, and then you can see that the derivative starts to, to increase uh, above a unit slope. This is our uh, closure event. So our, the fracture is actively closing. Again, this is not diffusive behavior. This is indicative of, of a mechanically closing fracture. Uh, and then eventually, once the fracture closes, uh, we mechanically closes, I should say, we start to see inflow from our fluid bank region, uh, the initiation of a, a unit slope on our derivative plot, and the start of that 
unit slope is our reservoir pressure pick, which in this case is about 31.3 MPA. So now we've got our reservoir pressure and our contact pressure. The next step is to do our straight line analysis. So again, focusing on this uh, before uh, contact pressure period where we're seeing our fracture depletion, we can then analyze that data using our straight line analysis method. Now, one thing I, I didn't mention earlier is we can do this using RNP or we can do it using the RNP derivative. Here, we're actually uh, choosing rate normalized pressure derivative, plotting it versus material balance time. Now on a Cartesian plot, because we're doing our straight line analysis. And uh, we uh, take that data that corresponds to the unit slope on our derivative, that would be right here. And uh, we fit a straight line through that data, the slope of which allows us to calculate the total system stiffness. Okay. Once we have that total system stiffness, we can calculate the fracture area, the open fracture stiffness, and ultimately permeability using uh, the H function method that we talked about earlier. So from this particular test, we're able to obtain an estimate of the fracture surface area, the open fracture stiffness, the contact pressure, the minimum in situ stress, reservoir pressure and reservoir permeability all in a period of about three hours. So very rapid test. We don't have to wait days or weeks to get estimates of reservoir pressure and permeability. Uh, just for reference, the permeability estimate we have here is about 300 nanodarcies for quite consistent with uh, conventional defits that were performed in this area and other uh, estimates of, of reservoir permeability. So very importantly, we note that the speed and the accuracy of the DFIT FBA really has enabled some new applications of DFITs that weren't previously possible. Uh, so I'm going to have to go through this fairly quickly, um, but uh, the, the first uh, innovative application was uh, the application of DFIT FBA to multiple zones in a, a vertical well in an exploration play in Australia. Uh, where we obtained parameters from DFIT FBA for several shale, shale layers to enable the operator to determine where they were going to land their lateral. That was one application courtesy of Bainham, Zangane, and, and Origin Energy. Next innovative application was a long well DFITs where we did toe, mid stage, and near heel stage DFIT FBAs to, to get a long well property estimates, uh, which as far as we understand has never been done before with a DFIT. And then finally, uh, the use of DFIT FBA to identify faults uh, in order to evaluate any risk of induced seismicity. So just going through uh, two of these applications, the along well DFIT application uh, is, uh, is illustrated here. Again, we had a toe stage, middle stage, and near heel stage. Uh, DFIT FBA that were run in this particular lateral. We did this uh, in collaboration with Birchcliff Energy here in Canada. Uh, we note that previous field trials of our DFIT FBA method were on the toe only, so this was really one of the first tests where we could do an along well evaluation. And our purpose was to evaluate minimum in situ stress, pore pressure, and permeability along this particular Montney multi fractured horizontal well. The results of the testing are shown here. Uh, we were able to get estimates of minimum in situ stress, uh, reservoir pressure, which is in red here, and permeability, which is in green. And you notice that the in this particular case, the minimum in situ, it's in, minimum in situ stress and reservoir uh, pressure are relatively constant, but there's a significant difference in the permeability from uh, toe to heel for this well. Now the operator, in this case Birchcliff, is quite interested in using this along well testing to, to look for depletion along the lateral, uh, and that helps with their stimulation design in offset laterals. Another important application for DFIT FBA is, is to uh, evaluate the risk of induced seismicity, and, and for this purpose, fault identification is, is quite important to us. Uh, we note that Microseismicity is, is really one of the consequences of hydraulic fracturing, and there's been 
several documented uh, examples of induced seismicity where we can see events greater than 2.0 that have been linked to hydraulic fracturing. Uh, for example, here in Canada in the Horn River Basin, 216 earthquakes detected between 2009 2011 and 21 of these events have uh, magnitudes, great, uh, mag magnitudes greater or equal to three. In the Montney Formation, similarly, more than 200 earthquakes between 2013 and 2019, uh, several of which have magnitudes between one and a half and 4.6. So we note that the, the presence of faults, pre-existing natural fractures and critically stressed rock conditions are, are several of the factors that contribute to induce seismicity effects. So our purpose was to develop a tool, a diagnostic tool to identify faults, pre-existing hydraulic fractures or, or depleted areas using uh, multi-point or multi-cycle DFID FBA test. Now the diagnostic that we're using is actually our contact point identification. So here uh, we again plot flowing pressure versus flowback time. Uh, the Contact point is obtained as the, the end of this first uh, tangent line where we see a deviation downward in our flowing pressure. And we note that that contact point timing can change uh, depending on, on several factors. So for example, from analytical modeling, we uh, have uh, observed that by injecting or by increasing our injection volume, i.e. increasing our injection rate or injection time, that time of the contact pressure can actually increase. Um, conversely, if uh, we increase our Carter leakoff coefficient, which is uh, done by increasing permeability or decreasing pressure, that can actually accelerate the fracture contact time. So, uh, for an example, uh, if we have, if we're detect trying to detect a fault system, we note that. The fault core can be relatively impermeable, but adjacent to that, we may have a zone that is of elevated permeability. So if we're able to intersect that damage zone or fault zone with a mini fracture, we might be able to detect that in the timing of our contact pressure. So theoretically, higher permeability should accelerate the time to contact, and, uh, and that's uh, exactly what we were hoping to see if we hit a fault zone. So in order to identify heterogeneities, uh, we actually uh, proposed two different approaches using DFID FBA. One was to perform a multi-cycle uh, test where uh, what we do is we perform the test at a single point in the well here at the toe of the well, and we increase our injection volumes uh, for each subsequent test. And this means that we propagate a larger and larger fracture away from the well. So if we hit a heterogeneity, uh, in this particular case, if we have a homogeneous system, we expect the time of contact to increase for each successive uh, defit because of the increased volumes. But if we actually intersect a fracture with say the largest, uh, with the, with the largest uh, test, then that would decrease the time of contact pressure. So that's one way to detect a heterogeneity. Another is to do a mult, what we call a multi-point approach. This is where we're doing the exact same test design, but at different points, either along a lateral or between laterals. So for this scenario, if the reservoir is heterogene uh, sorry, homogeneous, then the contact pressure timing would be the same for each test. But if one of these fractures intersects a heterogeneity, that would accelerate the contact uh, point. So let's illustrate this first using a simulation and then we'll show a field case and we'll wrap it up. Uh, so here uh, we're again using ResFrac. We have well A and well B. We propagated our mini fracture. We have exactly the same test design, but in the case of well B, that mini fracture has intercepted a damage zone which has an elevated permeability. So if we look at the contact point uh, diagnostic, uh, flowing pressure versus flowback time for uh, well A, we get a contact uh, time shown here at about 0.5 hours. Uh, whereas well, sorry, that's yeah, this well A for well B that intersected the fault zone, we see a significantly accelerated contact pressure time. 
So with these simulations and these observations, we're now ready to actually start to look at some field cases. So um, I'm just going to show one here uh, where uh, in this case, working with an operator, uh, Oventiv in Canada in the, in, uh, the Montney formation, they did a DFID FBA on, uh, on two laterals, a uh, toe of two laterals, well A and well B. And you note that the test design is basically exactly the same or essentially the same for both uh, DFID FBA one and two. So about 8.9 cubic meter injection volume versus eight and a half, 20 liters per minute versus 19 and a half. Uh, so we then use our contact pressure time plot uh, for well A, which is the innermost well. We get a contact time of about 1.2 hours. For well B, we have a contact time of about 0.2 hours. So significantly accelerated contact point for well B. So that difference between the obtained values uh, indicates that the hydraulic fracture at the toe of well B, i.e. Uh, DFID FBA2, propagated into a high permeability zone, which we determined to be or, or had hypothesized was the damage zone of a fault. So this information combined with field information, the operator actually had seismic data, was able to confirm that a fault did in fact pass close to well B. So there's a fracture zone right about here, or a fault zone, I should say, right about here that DFID FBA had, uh, number two, had intersected, resulting in this accelerated time to contact pressure. All right, so just to wrap it up here, I know I'm going a bit over time here. Uh, we developed a new DFID FBA, uh, DFID method called DFID FBA that's been developed and tested in the field. It involves the creation of a small fracture followed by flowback uh, of the injective fluids at two to 5% of the injection rate. The proposed method has been validated against conventional defits. We're able to obtain all the same information uh, as a conventional defit in a fraction of the time uh, required by conventional defits. The speed of the new test has enabled new applications of defits, including selection of target intervals for exploration programs, a long well reservoir quality and pressure variability for development programs, evaluating the risk of induced seismicity and a few other things we're working on. Uh, and uh, although we may be overstating it, we believe that DFID FBA could revolutionize DFID testing in unconventional reservoirs. And there's been a number of our uh, part industry partners that have uh, run the DFID FBA, more than 200 of them have been run uh, by multiple companies as shown here. So I'll wrap it up with uh, acknowledging our sponsors of Tidal Oil Consortium, our NSERT grant funding, and of course, Whitson for allowing me to present this to you today. So with that, I'll stop sharing and open it up for questions. Awesome, thank you, Dr. Clarkson. Um, we have a, a bunch of questions. We'll see if we can get through them all. In fact, if you wanna to navigate to the chat window, I'm gonna let you just look at them and see which ones you think might be the juiciest questions to use in our time. Then we can answer the rest later if we don't have time. Uh, okay. Um, ah, yeah, lots of good questions. Um, okay. Yeah, take your time to check them out. Okay. Um, yeah, so just a, a very practical question. Um, uh, would appreciate recent costs for this method, pumping, flowback, metering, uh, and fall off time. So actually in Daniel Zanabody's thesis, he actually compares uh, conventional defit uh, costs versus the flowback defit cost. So as you would expect, because we have to measure rates using uh, some sort of a flow meter, uh, that adds a bit of a additional cost, but it's not that significant really. Uh, when you consider the timing and the number of the defits that can actually be done. So that's very good a question. If you want some actual numbers uh, in Daniel's thesis, um, he's got those numbers uh, provided and uh, and I can share those with you uh, at a later time here. Uh, let's see here for got to take my glasses off here. Um, for the whole workflow, does your group have the code to automate it and generate the final parameters and plots directly given the pressure rate and as inputs or involve some manual work in the workflow. Um, 
Yeah, so that's a good question. We actually don't have an automated uh, software per se. Uh, we There is some manual type work. So the, the analogy I would use is if you were to use commercial software for for doing uh, well test analysis. Uh, so there's a certain amount of manual, you know, selecting flow regimes and and the data required to to uh, do your straight line analysis. That part is very consistent with conventional well test analysis. But you know, in terms of the line fitting and things like that, a lot of that is actually done automatically for you in the software that we use. Uh, so yeah, I got a thumbs up. So uh, suggesting I. Uh, did what they asked me to do here. Uh, I'm going to ask, there's another question. Uh, what are the challenges associated with interpreting DFID, uh, DFID, F, uh, DFID FBA data and what methodologies are being developed to address these challenges? Excellent question. Um, one of the biggest issues that we have, one of the biggest uncertainties that we have right now is that reservoir or pore pressure uh, estimation because it relies on you to have that second unit slope Sometimes that unit slope isn't fully developed. Um, and then there's some uncertainty in picking that uh, initial pore pressure point. Uh, we're working on that right now. So we have, um, uh, I mentioned uh, Sajjad Hakparest, he's actually working on a methodology uh, that allows us to constrain that initial pore pressure pick. But I would say that's probably the biggest challenge that we have right now is really honing in on that, on, on that pore pressure. So, as one it would expect at the start of that unit slope, you've got this fluid bank adjacent to the fracture and that pressure's elevated somewhat above formation pressure because you've got some fluid that's leaked off during the uh, mini fracture uh, creation and propagation. And so in general, if we were to err, we know that we would tend to err on the high side. Uh, so we are, are looking at uh, ways to, to kind of constrain that um that 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 pressure pick but that's the biggest challenge that we're facing right now um how are we doing Graham, for time? <laughs> sure, just, just, that's okay just a comment um david jones commented that oh. for the cost that they chesapeake executed this technique for less than ten thousand dollars us he said it was a fraction of the cost of a standard oh. ha well there you go that's that's much better information than i can provide you because there's an operator that's actually done it uh, thanks, David. I appreciate that. That's uh, uh, th that your numbers are in line with a, with what I think Daniel had in his thesis. It was somewhere on the order of, uh, of course, we were talking about Canadian dollars. So multiply that by what three? No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Um, yeah. So th those numbers I think are pretty consistent with what we were looking at. And and thanks for the comment, David. I really appreciate that. Perfect. Um, maybe Chris, answer one more question. But then what we'll do for everyone is we're gonna. Um, make sure Dr. Clarkson gets all these questions and we'll just do, we'll, in the follow-up email with the recording, we'll have all the answers. So we'll make sure we do that. But is there one last question we want to finish with? Sure, there's uh, one question from Ricardo. What are the limitations of the applicability of the method in terms of permeability estimation? Another great question, another, another uh, uh, topic that we're working on in our group. Uh, with the before closure, uh, estimates, and I, I think McClure has talked a bit about this uh, in his work for conventional defits. Um, I would expect, and I, I think most, most people would expect that, um, you know, because of the uh, stress dependence of, of uh, permeability, i.e. you've got an, you know, have an elevated pore pressure, effective stress is relatively low. Uh, my anticipation is that before closure, derived permeability should be somewhat elevated above permeability at reservoir pressure or below reservoir pressure. Uh, simulation that work that we've done has has borne this out. Um, but we are also looking at um, trying to derive permeability from the after closure period. So we uh, using uh, like a flowing material balance type analysis on that after closure flowback data. Uh, it is theoretically possible to obtain permeability, but of course, you have to know something about the fracture geometry, et cetera. So we've got an iterative workflow that we're working on right now to estimate permeability from, from the flow back part of it. And that'll uh, get you a permeability that's more consistent with the below reservoir pressure estimate of permeability. So we're working on it. Hopefully we'll get that uh, released in the not too distant future. Amazing. Thank you. Okay, so everyone on here is going to get an email with this recording with all the other questions answered. 
And make sure to visit wisdom.com slash training for upcoming webinars. The next one is May 15th by uh, Pat Miller from Patronus. And it's going to be Death by a Million Grid Cells, How to Accelerate Well Spacing and Completion Design, Making Unconventionals with Simple Tools. So that'll be May 15th. And uh, you can register at wisdom.com slash training. Thank you so much, Dr. Carson. We really appreciate your time today. Thank you for listening. I really appreciate it. And thanks for inviting me, Graham. Okay. Have a great day, everyone. Take care. Bye.